Now, I should say, I'm not going to give up uh, any additional time on Friday beyond what questions you may have. So, uh, I expect you to come to class Friday with your questions. So, we can review stuff together, and when that review time ends, then we're going to launch forward into exam three. So I always like to say that. That way I make sure that even if you don't have questions, you will continue to ask random things to fill up all the time <laughs> on Friday. Okay, so this is sacral plexus stuff, and we, uh, we looked at the gluteal muscles and talked about the superior and third gluteal nerves uh, last time. If you were to innervate those, and um, today, uh, so we talked about lumbar plexus also last time, so we saw the femoral operator innervation of the quadricep muscles and all the AD, the adductors. And so today we've turned around to the back of the leg and we're talking about this largest nerve in the body called the sciatic nerve. It's made of two nerves, really, and these are the tibial and the common fibula. And the first ones we're going to look at are the hamstrings. So the first motor step we'll talk about is the hamstrings. Remember I told you? I hope this is a good way for you to remember it. There's only one of the quads that goes all the way to the hip. There's only one of the hamstrings that doesn't. And so we're going to see that today. Um, all the ones that do go to the hip um, are innervated by the tibial. And the only one that doesn't is the short head, the bicep femoris. That one stops short, it doesn't go all the way up to the initial tuberosity, and it gets stimular. So those are things that will help you as you're trying to remember all this information. Alright, and then we'll look at um, the tibial and fibular splits as we work our way down the leg. Um, as you guys are well aware, you don't really have any muscles on the front of your leg, distal to the knee. That's a bone, shin bone. And so we'll look at those muscles lateral there, we'll name them in order. Um, Annette helped me with this yesterday afternoon in the lab. We went through this together slowly. And so we so learn these things from anterior to posterior. Learn the attachments because that, that's helpful in looking for the tendons. And so um, we'll do that together. It'll help you also as you're going to in the lab on, on tomorrow. All right, so here they are, hamstrings, the lateral mass of muscle is the bicep femoris. It's two heads. There's a long head and there's a short head. Now notice that the long head, along with the medial muscle groups of the hamstrings, the tendinosus and the membranosus, all attached to the ischial tuberosity, all the way up to the hip, all the way up to the butt bone, um, three of the four. Now, this one also attaches to the head of the fibula um, and the lateral condyle uh, of the tibia and fibula. All right. The short head then has its attachment to the linea aspera. You get a list there, aren't you? Big long list of muscles that attach to the linea aspera. Um, and then the semitendinosus and the semimembranosus, these are the muscles on the medial side. So the bicep femoris, these are the muscles on the lateral side. The semitendinosus and membranosus are the muscles on the medial side. Now, um, this is also a little tricky on your cat. When I look, look at these on the cat in the laboratory, I always straighten the leg out and think about it as a human leg. Because the images that you have in your lab manual of uh, these lateral views with the leg basically laid over like this, or laid over like that, and it makes it difficult to orient where these muscles are. This will help you. This muscle, the semimembranosus, is the big one. The semimembranosus is the big one. Um, the tendinosus is more like a strap. If you're looking at it. so I see some nods, y'all have seen that in the cat already. And if you look at this on the muscle model that's in the lab, the, the human model, you get a sense of this. Not only is the tendinosus a strap and the membranosus is a big one, but the membranosus is really the bulk of the mass. And so you can see that on the model um, in the lab. Now you see how it's hidden here because the tendinosus is actually a little bit superficial to the membranosus, but that's a big one, and I want to make that point here. The semimembranosus is the big one. I want you to look at the attachments here. Yes, ischial tuberosity. Um, sure enough, all the way up. Yes? But look at these distal attachments. It attaches to the medial condyle of the tibia. 
So I'm medial, right? I'm, I'm in the popliteal fossa now, on the back of the knee. It also attaches to the lateral condyle of the femur. Huh. That is, there's a kind of a tendon sheet here for this muscle that crosses in an oblique fashion, an angled fashion, right? The lateral condyle of the femur to the medial condyle of the tibia crosses the back of the knee in an angle. Now, those ligaments have names, and we'll look at them um, here. Um, I want you to see it here because, uh, well, let's look at it here and I'll go back to it since I'm talking about it already. Lateral condyle of the femur across this way to the medial condyle of the tibia. Now, does it surprise you then to see the bursa located here, which I've not introduced to you, call the semimembranosus bursa? What, in fact, is the material of the oblique popliteal ligament? It is really the fused material of the tendon of the semimembranosus. And so you can see it strapped across here in this oblique fashion, this oblique popliteal ligament, is in essence the tendinous material of the semimembranosus muscle. Now that's true on the front of the knee and on the back of the knee with this stuff because when, remember when I told you about the quadriceps, they come down across the front of the knee and your book says they're all attached to the patella. But that doesn't do us any good for extension at the knee. They've got to attach to the tibial tuberosity. So all that tendinous material uh, it's on this picture too. <laughs> All that tendinous material that comes across the front of the knee is really the tendinous material of the quadriceps. The tendinous material on the back of the knee is the tendinous material of the semimembranosus. So really the packaging of the knee on the front and the back are the quad tendons and the semimembranosus tendons. That's the major packaging on the front and the back of the knee. But whenever there's bone-to-bone -bone attachments, like from the lateral condyle of the femur to the medial condyle of the tibia, we call them ligaments. They're really part of the fused tendinous material that comes off the muscles. You wouldn't be able to distinguish them apart. All right, now, that's the attachment of the hamstring stuff here. You can see I actually write it in here via the uh, oblique popliteal ligament. Now, before I teach you what's actually in this knee, so we're going to look in the knee here for a moment, and then we'll look at the muscles down here on the bottom. I wanted to show you a couple other interesting muscles here. It gives me a chance to talk about how the knee works. So this muscle is the one, the focus for this particular slide. It's called the popliteus. Now here's what happens when you stand up. It's very interesting. When you stand up and you extend at your knee, the condyles of the femur are articulating with the condyles of the tibia. They're not touching the fibula. But they do not work like a perfect hinge. Instead, what happens is the lateral condyle hinges and stops. At that point in time, the medial condyle of the femur is actually anterior. And then as you lock your knee into place, the medial condyle slips posteriorly. The book describes this as rotation. It's a little confusing to me. It is rotating, but it is rotating medially. The medial condyle is rotating medially to lock the knee into place. Now, in order for you to undo that, you need a muscle to help you. And this little guy does it. This popliteal muscle is attached to the lateral condyle of the femur and the proximal tibia. Obviously, this one would have to be on the medial side, right? It's on the proximal end of the tibia here on the medial side. You can see it right here. So you can imagine now what happens when this contracts. It pulls the femur like that, and the medial condyle of the femur then moves forward. And that unlocks your knee so that you can, so that you can flex at the knee. So the popliteus then unlocks, rotating the femur laterally to unlock the knee. Okay, so it's a sophisticated movement in the knee. I think we should spend some time looking at what's in here. 
So on the front and the back of the knee. The front of the knee is covered by a tendinous sheet of quadricep connected material. And they have names, just like we saw the semimembranosus has a, an oblique popliteal ligament for its name. These guys have names. Now, I've mentioned to you this one, the patellar ligament that extends over the patella. But they actually, um, the, techs, the techs actually name the material that's on the medial and lateral sides as well. And they're called retinaculums. The medial patellar retinaculum is coming off the medial, off the vastus medialis. The lateral patellar retinaculum is coming off the vastus lateralis. Now, you want to get in the front of the knee, you've got to go through this stuff. On the back of the knee, you've got to go through the biggest sheet here, the oblique, oblique popliteal, which is part of the semimembranosus muscle. Now, um, let's then look at the major ligaments that hold this thing together. Um, so first, there are two ligaments that stabilize the knee outside of the capsule. Now let me just remind you of something here um, that we did, because I don't want you to get confused, and I'm going to show you a picture of it here in just a moment, so I'll get to say it twice. I don't want you to get confused here when I use the words extra and intracapsular. Um, whenever we did tissues way back when, I just very briefly mentioned this, and it's not really that big of a deal. You would never need this um, really clinically, but I just mentioned it as a way to help you think of what we're talking about. So, um, if you looked at a tendon or a ligament under a microscope, that stuff would look very parallel in its arrangement. That's dense regular connective tissue, very strong. So it wouldn't matter on this picture whether you saw the medial patellar retinaculum or the patellar ligament or the oblique popliteal ligament or the tendon of the semimembranosus. You wouldn't really, you wouldn't even be able to tell under a microscope that it's the ligament or the tendon. It's all the same stuff. However, the material that actually encapsulates the joint, so the, the, the joint cavity itself, where the synovial membranes are and the pockets of fluid are inside the joint, there is a cavity that is encased, an enclosed cavity inside every movable joint in your body. You would have to actually cut through another piece of membrane. Like I said, I'll show you in just a second. And that stuff looks different. That material actually is dense, irregular connected. So I see some nodding. Some of you vaguely remember this from the histology stuff. And so when I say for the ligaments, extracapsular and intracapsular, what I really mean is the extracapsular ligaments are on the outside of that cavity that is encased by that package of dense irregular connective tissue. And the intracapsulars are on the inside of it. It's important, I think, um, to at least know the terms because if you're going to repair an anterior cruciate ligament, you will have to penetrate the capsule. You'll have to go inside. So there are two on the outside, two on the inside. The two outside ones are called the collateral ligaments. There's a fibular collateral and a tibial collateral, commonly referred to as the LCL for the fibular, lateral collateral ligament, and the MCL for the medial collateral ligament. Now, these two ligaments are normally injured in blows to the medial or lateral side of the knee. Moving the knee this way or that way injures these. And you oftentimes will also injure, when this happens, the fibrocartilage pads, which we've talked about before, the menisci, that sit between the condyles of the femur and the condyles of the tibia. They are C-shaped. So they're thick on the front and the back and the sides. They're not thick on the interior portions of the capsule. And so the menisci, the fibrocartilage, are intended to help you keep the condyles from moving off anterior or posterior or medial or lateral. They hold the condyles in place. So if you damage one of these, it is likely that you also at least stress part of the cartilage. 
And remember, cartilage injuries are much harder to deal with in terms of hope for healing. Okay, so those are the collaterals. Now, the ligaments that are inside that hold the knee together are called the cruciate ligaments because they cross the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. Now, we'll start with the anterior because you can see it on this side, and I want to say this. These two ligaments are named for their attachment on the tibia. So when I say anterior cruciate ligament, it's on the anterior of the tibia. When I say posterior, it's on the posterior. Now, this will help you remember this also. In the world we live in today, the most common injury in the knee is this anterior cruciate ligament. And when I was a young man, an ACL injury was the end of a sports career. But that is not true anymore. And the reason for that, the primary reason for that, was a major change in the way this ligament is repaired. Today, the ACL ligament is not repaired inside the capsule anymore. Instead, the surgeon will drill on the medial proximal tibia, a hole. The hole will be drilled from the medial proximal tibia now, we're outside the capsule, through the intercondylar fossa, out on the lateral side of the femoral condyle. And then ligament, ligamentous material normally borrowed either from the hamstrings or borrowed from the cadaver will then be strapped all the way from the outside of the tibia to the outside of the femur. It has been estimated um, by many that the new ACLs that are being put in place today are better than the originals. Because you can staple this thing on the outside. It's not going to tear off of there. And if it's thicker than the original, it's going to be stronger. And that's exactly what they do. So this is the attachment that will help you remember where it goes, okay? from the tibia up through the femur. There's a hole drilled there. And now you can see it's attachment anterior. Really, the original ACL doesn't cross as much as the new ones do. It's attached right on the intercondylar eminence here on the front side. And then if you look over this way, the ACL attaches to the lateral condyle of the femur. The posterior, or PCL, attaches to the posterior intercondylar eminence, and then it crosses over here and attaches to the medial condyle of the femur. They cross in the intercondylar fossa. One more thing. So, the, the guy's down. He's laid on the field. Everybody saw it. When he was tackled, the helmet hit his knee in the front and his knee then hyperextended. The fear among everyone who knows anything about knee anatomy is his ACL just got ripped and he's done, at least for this season. So the athletic trainer, the orthopedic surgeons, Dr. Reiser, Dr. Brune, they run out onto the field and everybody stands. Any anatomy students around me, we immediately start the quizzing. Yes? <laughs> what are they about to do to this young man? Yes, you guys know, you've seen this before, right? So, this is attached on the front of the tibia and on the back of the lateral condyle. On the front of the tibia and the back of the lateral condyle like this. Which means if it is there, you will not be able to pull the tibia forward. So when all the weight is taken off of the leg, sit them on the bench, on the sideline, the orthopedic guy pulls on the tibia this way. And if it comes forward, it's gone. The ACL is gone. Yeah. Now your question. So when they do that surgery, what do they do with the original ACL? I don't know. I assume they just, whatever's left of it, well, if it's torn and damaged, the immune system's already chewing it up. Okay. But I suspect they're not going to leave whatever's left in there either. Because as I was going to say, when I had my surgery, I had to go in and have another one because it had broken off into a whole bunch of pieces and was messing everything up. Yeah, well, they should have got it the first time, they, right? Well, what happened was they went in and they tried to save it the first time, oh, okay. and then my body rejected it about three months later. So you had a cadaver uh, piece put in? Uh, no. 
What do you mean it rejected it? They went in and they tried to trim up all the stuff that, all the meniscus that was like dead and it was like, it looked like crab meat, it was all kind of. Okay, crazy. well that's, that's, you're, that's cartilage you're talking about now, right? right? Yeah. Okay. So they went in and tried to cut out what was, what wasn't good and tried to keep what was still alive. Oh, okay. And then the stuff that was kind of still alive ended up kind of falling apart too, so I had to go in and have it all taken out. Oh, okay. Well, that makes more sense then. Yeah. Okay. So that's all I want to say about the knee. Now, since I'm at the joints here, I've said all these terms before. Um, this is in an earlier presentation that I didn't go through. Uh, if you're looking in your notes, you don't. You can just watch this because this is going to take like three minutes. I have used these terms with you all along the way: adduction, adduction, flexion, extension, um, um, rotation. We just used circumduction, supination, and pronation. We've used all these terms, but I like to uh, at least for just a couple of minutes go through them. Because everything we've been talking about in terms of joint movement is really this stuff, synovial joints, the movable joints. And they have some very uh, typical characteristics of them and I want you to see that. You just saw it and I've said it, but I want to say it again sort of in a, a summary type fashion. Okay, you also know this. There are other places where bones meet each other, where the body is put together. Joints. There are, uh, in terms of definitions, there are fibrous joints and cartilaginous joints, and you've been introduced to all of these. So a fibrous joint, if I said a bone is made out of fibrous connective tissue, what kind of bone formation is that? It's not made from cartilage, it's made from fibrous connective tissue. What kind of bone? Okay, this is, it's not endochondral ossification, made from cartilage, instead it's intra Membranous ossification made from a thick sheet of connective tissue, fibrous connective tissue, right? Turns out that some of that remains even after birth. We call those the sutural joints and the fontanelles of the skulls. Okay, so I just I point this out because you know this. Fibrous connective tissue joints range from immovable joints, like those of the skull, uh, to slightly movable, these joints that we call syndesmosis. Now we're going to say a couple. We're going to say this um, today again. Whenever we say uh, we talk about the interosseous membrane here in just a second, syndesmosis joints are the joints specifically between the radius and ulna and the tibia and the fibula. So yesterday, Annette and I were in the lab, we're digging around, and we found a muscle there that was tearing. It appeared to be attached to both the tibia and the fibula. It was on the lateral side of the crura. And I said, see, it looks like it won't come off of those bones, even though we could move it around a little bit, but it looks like we're tearing it because it is fused to the interosseous membrane between, remember that? Between the tibia and the fibula, the extensor digitorum longus on the crura. And so we're going to see that again here in just a second. This is a syndesmotic joint. Um, between the tibia, fibula, race, ulna. Okay, and there's, this is just a thick piece of connective tissue. You find blood vessels and nerves in them, and sometimes the muscles are attached there as well, between those bones. And then a gonthosis joint is with the teeth. All right, so we haven't looked at that, but I'll show you a picture of it. Cartilaginous joints can be fibrocartilage like where? <clears throat> fibrocartilage joint? Yeah, we've looked, at, we've looked at this today, right? You've got these menisci in the knee. You know they're in the, um, they're in the pubic bone, pubic symphysis we talked about last time. We saw them between the bones of the vertebral column, the fibrocartilage there. We call those symphysis joints. And others of them are immovable. Y'all knew this too. If you do a heart surgery, you don't cut the attachment of the ribs to the sternum. Why not? Because it won't heal because it's cartilage. What kind of cartilage? It's hyaline cartilage. We call those synchondrosis. You see the cartilage name in it? A synchondrosis joint where those cartilages are. But the ones we've really been emphasizing are these synovial. So let's look at their movements uh, after we look at pictures. Suture, syndesmotic, gomphosis, symphysis, and here's the synovial. 
Now this is a knee. I did this on purpose because you just learned it. So you know about the tenants of the quadricep here and the tenants of the semimember nosis on the back. But this picture shows you some other things that are typical. The first one I want you to notice is there's a cavity here. Can you all see it? It's black. It's a joint cavity. The ligaments that are inside that cavity we call the intracapsular ligaments. Those are the cruciate ligaments. Would you find the MCL and the LCL going through this cavity? No, they're on the outside of that cavity. And the cavity itself is a different kind of tissue. And you can see that there's cartilage on the ends of the bones in that cavity. What kind of cartilage is that? Okay, right. But what kind? No. What? This is hyaline. Yeah, the bone was made from hyaline cartilage. This is what remains, the hyaline cartilage. So in the knee joint, how many different kinds of cartilages are actually cushioning the articulation between the femur and the tibia? Two. There's hyaline on the ends of the bones. So if you lost your fibrocartilage pads, the menisci, they were damaged, you had to get them out of there. Are you bone on bone? No. No, you're cartilage on cartilage still, but it won't be long now. Right? It won't be long now. Okay, and then you can see also the capsule itself is lined. You see the red thing lining it there? That is a highly vascularized membrane called the synovial membrane. And it normally, it normally leaks a little fluid into the synovial joint. This is the lubrication in the synovial joint. This cavity in here is moist all the time because of that synovial membrane. Now, what do you think is going to happen to the blood vessels in the synovial membrane if you rip something inside the capsule? If you tear cartilage or you tear tissue, you damage things, what's going to happen is an inflammatory response. And the blood vessels there in the synovial membrane become extremely permeable. White cells are coming to the rescue to try to clean the mess up. But what does that look like? Swelling. Massive swelling. And everybody hates that because it hurts. So they want to suck the fluid off and then give you a cortisone shot. Cortisone is a steroidal anti-inflammatory. It anti-inflates by changing the permeability of the blood vessels in the synovial membrane. It shuts down the leaking, and that feels good. So, <clears throat> all that just to help you remember what a synovial membrane is. This highly vascularized membrane surrounding the capsule. All right, now other joints that we mentioned in passing, as we were going, we'll just look at each of these in turn. This is the joint between the mandibular condyle, way back at the beginning of this test section. And um, I never ask any questions about this. I like for students to see it, though, because a lot of times, and I like to tell a stupid joke with it, so get ready for the joke. Here it comes. Um, a lot of times students in my classes have problems with this joint, the temporomandibular joint. It, it is a fairly stable joint. There are several ligaments. There are three big ones um, that actually hold this thing in place. But it's also a very interesting synovial joint because it has a piece a disc here, a cartilaginous disc in the center of it, separating it into two joint cavities. Do you all see them? Now, this does several things for the joint, good and bad. The good thing is it makes the joint extremely mobile. So this thing has, you can, the, the joint here, you can do all kinds of things with that mandibular condyle in there. And, in reality, this joint is also like the knee, not just a simple hinge joint. So you know how the knee gives the, you extend and then, and then when you unlock it, you unlock it with the popliteus? This one, this joint, actually the condyle actually moves along that disc, anterior and posterior, every time you open your joint. So when you open your joint, this thing slides forward. And when you close it, it slides backwards. So all of your life is a sliding of the condyle on this disc right here. And so you need it. You need the disc to keep this surface off of that one, kind of like the menisci in the knee, right? You need this <coughs> disc in there to help prevent the bone on bone. 
But people who sleep at night and grind their teeth, a lot of stress and tension, some people just genetically predisposed to this, can wear that disc down and get bone on bone. And that's going to make pain in that joint. It's normally referred to as TMJ. And when I hear that, I go, somebody tells me that they have TMJ, I say, well, you don't have a very good anatomy teacher. Because you wouldn't have said it that way. Miranda sees the punchline coming. Yes? If you didn't have TMJ, you would be an odd looking person. Yeah? We all have TMJ. You have a temporal mandibular joint. What did you mean to say? I have a problem with my temporal mandibular joint. You don't have TMJ. Everybody has TMJ. You have a problem with your temporal mandibular joint. Okay, so it's interesting. All right, now, this, these, these slides detail the movements that I've given you before, but I want to show them to you so you can see them. That was not important to me. I just want to show you the ones that students get confused with. My job as a teacher, all these are obvious. There's a couple of them you go, where'd that come from? So you need to know them, all right? So flexion and extension. If I did this, everybody got flex extension. No problem, right? Flex extend. Nobody misses that. Flex extend. Nobody misses that. All right, how about this one? Now, technically, at the shoulder, uh, sorry, technically, flexion is to decrease the joint angle. Okay, but when I did this, you see how that's confusing? So you've got to memorize that. This is flexion. See it over here? This is extension at the shoulder. So everybody in the clinical setting knows this. Flexion at the shoulder, extension at the shoulder. The arms, hands move anterior and posterior, flexion, extension. Something you've got to learn, all right? How about this one? Uh, everybody can do this at the hip. Would you have guessed this is flex? And this is extend? Okay, you've been wrong. This is flex, right? What is this? That's extension. This is extension. This is? Hyperextension, okay? So again, these things that cause confusion. Flexion, extension, hyperextension. Same thing here, right? Flexion, extension, hyperextension. All right? How about this one? We're going to talk about this one as we finish class today. At the wrist, flexion and extension. Everybody knows. How about on your ankles? Which way is flexion and which way is extension? Yeah, this one's really bad, right? Because the muscle names are named flexors and extensors, but the joint movement does not have extension in it. And then, which one of these, according to the muscle names that we looked at yesterday in the lab, is extension? Yeah, so which word? Dorsiflexion is extension in terms of names of the muscles. And those dorsiflexors or extensors are all going to get fibular innervation. And the plantar flexors are all going to get tibial. <clears throat> in fact, there are two plantar flexors that also get uh, fibular. All right, everybody's got abduction, adduction, we've done that one. What about circumduction and rotation? So you tell me. 